Nicole. Okay, so so okay. First of all, I want to say how privileged I feel to be presenting this to you, knowing the strengths that are sitting in this room that are of the people that I'm talking to. So that's the first thing I really want to say is thank you. I'm honoured and I'm humbled. And my main intention, really, in sending you this paper and this presentation is to show you how our voices can be heard across the world for the betterment of the world, not just for us. And so that's, so I'm trying to encourage you all to actually have a voice and speak up and talk about the fantastic things that we together can do and are doing that aren't seen or aren't visible in the rest of the world. So I'll begin by saying, <coughs> I'm, I'll, I'll introduce myself, I'm Bobby Hunter and I work at Massey University here in New Zealand and I, I am a, a professor of Pacifica Studies, Education Studies, but my field of research is maths education for children, and that is where all my work comes from. So I come from, I, my mum was born in Manahiki, Rakahanga actually, and we are from the Dean family and from the Aparo family in Aitutaki. Oh. And my dad was born in Ireland and we're from the Kavanaugh family on that side. So I have a good mixture of fiery Irish blood, I think, and lovely laid back Cook Island blood. Something like that. Yeah. yeah, which, yeah, and it's, it, but I think that I have grown up, in fact, I never saw myself as British or Irish or anything to do with that. I've always seen myself as a Cook Islander and, and that's just my upbringing. You know, so my values and everything I take from that side. So this paper <coughs> is a paper that I presented with my daughter and another colleague in New York at, two years ago when you could travel. And um, it was at something called AERA, Associ Association of Educational Research. I think that's the name of it. And it came about because we had presented a similar paper at the New Zealand Association of Research here in New Zealand. And we were given a scholarship to, to pay for the travel to go to AERA to present it. So that's, and, so, and, and I actually think that this coming year, 2020, end of, uh, end of this year, maybe um, NZARI, which is the NZARE, will be in Samoa. And it would be fantastic if some of you thought about that as something to, to go and present because it's, it's, it, you know, this sort of work needs to be heard, and your work and your voice. So that's that's why I'm giving you a copy of what we actually did. Now, this was called a symposium. So that means three of us presented for 10 minutes, and then we talked. So I'm only going to focus on the first part of this, and I'm going to focus on the why. But I would, I'd like you to stop me as we go along and say, okay, you know, tell us more about that. Like, I don't want to just go into talk mode and be a talking head. I want to, to share with you yeah, in a supportive way. So I'll just fiddle around and share my screen to begin with. Okay, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, good. So everybody can see the screen. So what, what this paper was about, um, thinking about the um, Te Vai Vai and using that 
as a way of showing the values that Cook Island children bring to school, but we as researchers and educators could be thinking about as well. These values don't necessarily get um, seen in our schools here in New Zealand because we are schools are based so much on individualism, but actually we are doing quite a bit of work in the cooks. And I don't think it's much different. I think that even in the cooks, that in the schooling system, which I think has structural racism embedded in it because of the colonization, that the values the children bring from home aren't necessarily what's taught at school. So for, for instance, things like grouping by ability and having certain people as seen as more worthy than other people goes against the values of a family where everybody has a part to play. And yet that's the kind of value that's promoted in schools, the competitiveness. And so that's what this is about. But what I want to do is show you how you could use this as a way of um, analysing what you're doing rather than going to the European model. And, and actually, when you're actually doing that, you don't even have to justify why you do it, you just have to say, this replaces such and such. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go, to go to the European models of how you analyze data or your methods or anything like that. If you can say, look, I'm using this, this is what it stands for, right? Now, what we were trying to do was highlight the strengths of the children in mathematics. Yeah, now I've got to see if I can get this to move. Okay, so to start with, often the um, strengths of, of Pacifica children, as I've just said, are seen as deficits in this country. You know, that children come in through the gate and they leave their culture at home and they have to fit into the other dominant culture. And that causes them to fail in the system or adopt the dominant culture. Now, what we argue is that children should come into school, bring their culture into the classroom and succeed as they are. So mm. it's all about identity so that they, they can succeed, but they don't have to succeed by being the top student or the com most competitive, they can succeed by actually all working together. And if they enhance, if one child contributes something and others contribute something, then you get great thinking out of that. Okay. So, and, but the second part <laughs> is that we are very silent in this country at talking about structural racism really and how schools operate and and I think that we want to do something called desilencing. we want to actually bring it out in the open but do it kindly don't don't like I wouldn't go into somewhere and just say you're racist because that would be very offensive to do that but I can do it kindly by actually bringing the cultures of the Pacifica students into the classroom by opening the teacher's eyes. So it's actually having our families, our children, our parents teaching the teachers rather than this, we've got at the moment, we've got this whole position of it's always schools and teachers teaching parents. We're talking about relationships and partnerships with the community the school is a part of the community. The community does not just have to be a part of the school. So the community embraces the school as one aspect of it. So our questions, as you can see there, were how do teacher educators and teachers work together to co-construct classroom environments 
which actually allow for different interaction patterns bound on the cultural and social understandings and values of Pacifica people. Now, when we actually start to think about that, here in New Zealand, we are one of the countries that has probably one of the highest levels of grouping, ability grouping. And so I've spent years in my work going, talking to people about what ability, the damage ability grouping does, but also the reason why ability grouping means that so many of our um, Cook Island children end up in bottom groups and therefore are never given opportunities to learn. And, and I don't, and I, I'll keep going back to this, I don't think that is just New Zealand. I think that's prevalent in all the schools in the different island nations, including the Cook Islands. That grouping is part of how you teach and it sets you up to think that some can and some can't. So the interaction patterns have to be changed. For our teachers, that's a long journey. We have to learn how to do it because through our teachers' professional development, they're taught how to group rather than how to be inclusive. So it's not something that is easy to address and it needs deliberate focus. But the, what actually happens is that the, um, we have, like I said about de-silencing, race in mathematics is what I'm talking about because what it actually leads to is something that we call colour blindness and whiteness. So the children are left, teachers look at children and they say, oh, but they're all the same. They all have to do the same. Well, they're not the same. They all have their own identity. And so therefore they cannot be treated the same. And to actually call every child the same is actually evidence of colour blindness because usually the same means whiteness, that, that you have to be white just to be it. And it. But there are also other things. There's what we call othering, right? So groups of children get othered. And, and in being othered, they are set apart by culture, by their language, by their skin colour, and by their socioeconomic status. So people will say, oh, the reason why these children aren't learning is because they don't have enough food at home. Well, rubbish. No? Schools can feed children easily, make sure they have food, and those children can learn. So it's nothing to do with the socioeconomic. But all of the otherness gives people excuses and allows schools off the hook. So what we do is we, work, we do something called developing mathematical inquiry communities. And this is something that we've been doing now. I've been working in this field for 20 years. And it's a long journey to get things off the ground. It involves um, giving, giving children high expectations. So teachers not othering children, going in there and saying, yep, so they come from homes that don't have hundreds of books. I'm going to give them all the books they need and they will learn just the same as anybody else, you know, rather than the other way. The other thing, though, is that... Um, I'll just go. So there, and this is the model that we're looking at. And my mum made this, to I buy. So, um, yeah, and it's a family pattern, a chandelier. It's a chandelier pattern from Maniki. So it's beautiful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So, and, and this is what I mean about using your own way of presenting whatever you're presenting, no? is that we all have this beautiful work um, in our homes, and it's so easy to do it once you get a ho hold of it. So if you start to look at the Te Vai Vai model, and, and um, this is the model based on Hodge's work, 
Yeah, so you know, I pay credit to that, to her and her fantastic work, Tiri Moana Hodges. So the first, and, and unfortunately for me, I grew up in a home that doesn't have the language. So I'm stuck with English. But you are lucky because you've got the language, a lot of you. So it, this is going to be English that I'm talking. But at the core of these values is collaboration. It's not about competition. It's the opposite. It's collaboration. How can we work together for the greater good of all? So that's the first thing. Then there's the respect. And the concept of respect is vastly different from respect in a individualistic society. You know? So respect means different things to different people. Reciprocity, you know, how important is reciprocity in that I'm going to, to support you, we are going to support each other together. We are doing it for the greater good. Relationships. If we don't have relationships, we can't actually meet on a common ground. So relationships are so, so important. And a shared vision. That and, and you'll see that all of those words and all of those values run together. That's how a family works in a collective society. It's that everybody is working together for their family, not for themselves. And I think that's very important. And that's actually what I think in this day and age is what we need. I think the Pacific Islands and New Zealand have shown the rest of the world how we can work together to keep COVID out. And I think you could actually go through and analyse this. This is why we have not got COVID in our countries. And, and I think, but when you look and you sort of start to say what gives, you know, when you look at overseas and you see people not abiding by lockdown, you know, not wearing masks, they're only think of, thinking of themselves. So I think that, that these values have come into New Zealand from our Pacific peoples because, and they are part of what underpins us. And I think that's why I'm saying use them, you know, use them as a model, you know, to actually look at. And so I'm going to show you how I use them. As, as we went down through this. So first thing is I'm talking about DIMIC. So DIMIC is a professional development program, right? It's, it's not maths. It teaches teachers how to teach maths as the best evidence or best practices internationally and nationally. So, so yes, it is maths. But in schools, in Parirua, for instance, they use this way of teaching, doing their reading, doing their writing, doing science. So it's, it, it, it can be used right across everything, right? And that's one of the ways that we know that it's working well when the school, when the teachers start to say, why do I only do this in maths? Why don't I do this in reading? Why don't I do this? Right. So, so um, it, the second component of it is that it has teacher educators and teachers working <laughs> together in professional learning. So we have in our pro, in our pro, professional development program here in Auckland, and right, in fact we have fifty people now working right throughout New Zealand. But it consists of professional development days where all the, the teachers from the schools come together and they work together on where they're going to go to next. They, um, we have teacher educators, we call them mentors, who go into each classroom at least twice. And because we have some additional funding from Pacifica, we actually have them going in four times a term into our high Pacifica schools. So they go in there and they work alongside the teacher in the classroom, but they don't observe. They do something that we call co-construct. 
So together, they construct what would be a good maths lesson, which draws on the children's voice and draws on the children's values. And it's done headway, right? Now, the second thing, part of this, though, or actually, I can add some more things. We also, starting next week, we also run holiday programs where the children are coming in to some of our Pacifica schools and they will do, um, they come for a week and they come in at nine and they leave at 12.30 and they do a maths lesson of an hour and then they do STEM activities for the rest of the time so that they get access to a whole lot of STEM activities. These are very, very popular. And often, it, actually this time round, uh, we haven't got the numbers, but normally we have 200 children. They're voluntary, they're free, right? We also run parent, um, we also run parent maths lessons through the day in some of our Pacifica schools and after school as well to, to fit with when they can come in if they do the maths that their children are doing. And the reason for doing that is because the parents often have an idea of maths as something that you sit children down and you drill them. And we don't want them to drill them. We want the children to understand and to talk and to discuss and to explain. And so by bringing the parents in and doing maths with them and having them do how the children behave in a maths classroom, we always get feedback like, oh, I wish I'd done maths like that when I was a child. We do um, teacher knowledge workshops because teacher knowledge is always a bit of a problem. So we do that as well. And we have meetings as well where we bring together all of our, um, all of our parents and teachers and we get the parents to tell the teachers the maths they see their children doing at home that is not connected to, that is absolutely not connected to school maths or homework. So it's what oh. else do you do? Where else can you see maths? But we also um, have in some of the schools, just as a way of getting access to the maths, we give cameras to the children, to some children, and get them to take photographs of every time they are doing, they think they're doing something mathematical at home that is not tied to school maths again. And you get them. Does somebody want to talk? Yeah, can we ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure. I'm just aware that we've got a bunch of teachers in this room, and I'm just wondering if you can expand on your point there about some the need to re, uh, get teachers to rethink their approach to mathematics? Um, yeah, sure, sure. So, okay, if, if you're rethinking about, um, and, and we all do need to rethink our approach to mathematics, because if you think about traditional, what, what would be the traditional values that come out of, out of a maths classroom? You know, it, that, that's the first thing. So what would be the traditional? So if, if you walked away and somebody said to you, what are, your what are the things that you learn from being in a maths classroom? I think the first one would be speed. You've got to be fast. You've got to get it done. You've got to get it right, right? The other value is if you listen, if you, if you take notice and you listen, you learn that actually the teacher stands at the front, the teacher tells you what to do. If you're a good listener, you're going to learn it, right? Um, then also to the whole thing about that there's no culture, that mathematics is culture free, right? That actually everybody can do, do maths, except that some can do it much better than others and some are dumb. You know, there's that kind of thing. And that, that, and then I think for a lot of our Pacifica learners, there's also teacher expectation that we don't expect 
expect our children to do that because we other them. So, okay, if you rethink how mathematics should be taught, we think, oh, and of course you have a silent classroom. Mathematics is about practicing, sitting there and doing practice from a textbook. Well, actually, in reality, mathematics is about talking, explaining, justifying. It's about generalizing. It's about saying, well, if that works for that, then it'll work for this. That there isn't a single maths lesson. It should be a series of maths lessons that build on big ideas that you need, that actually children, the classroom, a maths classroom should not be a silent classroom. Children should be working in small groups and, and, come, and then the teacher should be re-looking at what they're coming up with and working, picking different children to explain to the rest of the class or the rest of the group, big group, what they came up with so that they build to the big ideas in mathematics. But we need to deliberately and explicitly teach children how to question each other, to make somebody explain deeper. We need to be deliberately and explicitly teaching children that actually you don't just sit there and listen, that you don't have a jug at the top of your head where you can lift the flap and tuck something in. But actually, you need to be asking questions and, and asking those questions can happen inside your head, you know, rather than outside. They don't just have to be said out loud that you can be all the time saying, do I get this? We need to get across to teachers and to children that every child can learn mathematics and they don't have to be the same as anybody else that they can all learn everybody. That's not true, that only some people can learn mathematics. There should be absolutely no competition in a classroom, in a maths classroom, because it's actually about, and, and like I quite often talk to children about this, I'll say, okay, you're working together on this problem. It's really hard today. It's really hard, but you'll do it. You'll get there because there are four of you and you're going to share your thinking and out of that, four great brains will come up with one great idea. So it's not about an individual child getting it, it's about all of the children getting it by collaborating. Does that make any sense? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and I think here on that PowerPoint I've got there that about challenging teachers' perceptions of students' capabilities. And, and part of that, part of the problem here in New Zealand is the widening demographic gap. And we, we have the problem where our teachers don't actually really know the children. And you can't expect them to because they, they are... Um, different, they've got a different culture, they've got a different way, that they're being brought up in an individualistic society. But actually they get paid to do their job. The children don't get paid to come to school. The children have the right to learn. So the teachers have to reframe how they think about children. And so that's really, really important. And so that's, as I was saying before, we get the children to bring in cameras we have done this, where the children come in and talk to the teachers about the maths they can see in something, and then, then they, the teachers write the problems. Now, the engagement of children around those problems is stunning. Like I, just recently I was in a classroom where a child had actually taken a picture of her grandmother working on a te vai and the teacher used that problem, used that picture in a in a photo um, in a problem um, doing geometry. And the children just all linked into that immediately. But also the teacher also reinforced the way of working together. <laughs> so she made she made points about this is not this Tivai is a taonga that actually in reality we, that's a treasure, 
it's not the grandmother's pattern like I showed you my T5 that goes back to my great great grandmother as a pattern so it's a family pattern not my pattern and somebody else cut the Tivai, a group of women spent time here at my house with my mum, um, actually tacking it. Different people have picked up bits and so on it. So it's actually how we work together to make one item. But at the end of it, who owns it? Not the child, not the person. And same with math. It's the uh, the ownership is everybody, and it's that whole idea. And the, but the other thing here is student voice. And we haven't actually had enough student voice. And, and one of the reasons why a lot of our children get put in those groups is because they don't talk at school. And so therefore the teachers don't know what they have or what they know. And so that actually getting students and deliberately teaching them how to talk in a culturally appropriate way is important. You know, and I quite often go into classrooms where a teacher, like I was in the Samoan immersion unit last at the end of last year, and the teacher was telling them, was saying to the children, you need to argue your maths. If you disagree, you need to argue about it, but you need to have a mathematical reason. And then she stopped and she said, hey, you wouldn't do this, would you, if you were at church or even probably at home? So what she was doing there was giving them a voice that was appropriate to the maths classroom, but in other places, not an appropriate voice. And she got the children to say when they would argue. And, and she reinforced, you're not arguing with a person you're arguing with their reasoning, their thinking. You're arguing with that idea. Right? And she talked again. She said, I know some of you think arguing is not a good thing to do. But she said, here in the maths classroom, in order to learn, you need to be able to use mathematical argumentation. So I think that's really important. And that's really what I'm talking about, about my conception of a maths classroom. And I've just, I talked about the demographic gap. And, but what we need, all of us, is this whole idea of a stance of inquiry and community building and collaboration that we need to actually be working together as one to look back and say, I guess, how has colonisation affected how we teach? And how can we go to the values and the beliefs of our people and do it differently? And it comes down to even achievement. What is achievement? What does achievement mean? Like here, here in New Zealand, our government compares achievement across groups of children and our Pacifica children always come off the worst. Well, I, I say that if they are achieving they have their identity intact and they have a disposition that allows them to learn. Right? We don't measure that. We don't measure who can work and support others. We just measure test results. So what we're really talking about here is this collision of two different sets of demographics. And and one of the things that, that I think is really important is that sometimes people say to me, do you need Pacifica teachers to teach Pacifica children? Well, actually, no. You need a good teacher to teach Pacifica children because our Pacifica teachers have also been inducted into colonised ways of education. And they've done okay. They've done well. So they can't understand why other children aren't doing so well. So they've succeeded in an individualistic society. 
So we need to be thinking about that. And I think the way to do that is this thing called pedagogy of discomfort, where you, um, to, uh, to actually make change happen, we have to become uncomfortable. We have to become comfortable with be being uncomfortable. And then you are going to have true inquiry. So if, if everything you see is fine and good, then you are you are going to not ever get to that state state of change. And and so yeah, that we're talking about this whole invitation to inquiry, but gently we think about all children, all teachers being on a journey. It's a journey of change. At times, being uncomfortable is too tiring, and so. You got teachers stay stuck at a point, that's fine. As long as at some point they're pushed again. No? No? So I'm just gonna show you now how these values, how I use the values to um, frame the interactions. But does anybody want to ask a question before I keep going? Yes. yes. Go for it. Can I, um, you were saying about teachers being uncomfortable uh, before teaching their, what about their, their teach? Can you um, explain more on that, please? About teachers being made to be, to get used to being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, if a teacher thinks they're the best teacher or that everything they're doing is right, they're comfortable. And that's not, they are not learning and they are not inquiring. So what you've got to do is, and we use our teacher educators do that. So it is, we call our mentoring dynamic mentoring. It's in the moment. We don't have our teacher educators in classrooms working alongside teachers, telling teachers what to do. We have our teacher educators in the classrooms asking the teachers what they think. So we use something called pause. So I might be in a room and I notice something that needs to be addressed. So I might say, can we pause? So the whole maths lesson pauses and I say to the teacher, did you hear what that child just said? I wonder what you're going to do to respond to them. So it's it's a reflective question. And that would include, do you notice how you've got your children all seated? Do you think that's going to support them working together? Or one of the classics is when children are explaining or questioning, they always look at the teacher, right? Rather than the community. So I would be pausing them and saying, can you pause, right? Do you notice who the children are looking at all the time? I wonder why they're doing that. I wonder what you're going to do about it. Because what they're actually doing is that the children are seeing the teacher as the authority in the classroom. And actually, it's about the community and shared learning. The teacher is a part of the community not the, you know, the total boss or authority. They are the facilitator. Right? So, so that's why I say that. But, and that makes teachers uncomfortable because they've been used to being the authority. And a lot of teachers believe that unless the teacher tells the children something, the children won't learn. But in fact... Other children might say something that is part of what everybody needs to hear. It goes right over teachers' heads because they haven't said it. So that's what I mean about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Is, is a lot of the things that we do in the classroom, we need to be thinking about. But there are also cultural things that happen that 
I think, wow, like, for instance, I was in a classroom where a teacher was teaching the children about isosceles triangles. And she had a picture of a Samoan axe with isosceles triangles on it. And she just went straight into this problem, you know, what makes them special triangles or whatever she did. I paused to her and I said, can we just go back a little bit? Can you, can you actually, do you think that you need to talk about the actual acts and how everybody has worked together to make that and the design? How could you use that? Now, in that course, it's not just the teacher educator. Our teachers get very good at asking for a pause as well. You know, they become aware, they hear something and they'll say, can I pause? And they pause the lesson and then the teacher educator and the teacher talks together. So it's adult learning. Now, I think teachers sometimes are uncomfortable even with that. You know, they, I think that teachers having, having adult conversations where children can hear makes them feel uncomfortable. You know, they're exposing their need to learn, but actually they need to do that. You know, it's fine. And children learn that it's lifelong learning and that's what they're doing. So I think that's really, really important. And I think being uncomfortable comfortable with being uncomfortable that that teachers in math has so many tiny components of how you build up an idea that things can go past you so you need to have a deep understanding that can be really uncomfortable for teachers and they therefore they avoid maths so, so we want them to be comfortable with being uncomfortable know that they have to work hard that maths takes a lot of work does that answer? Yeah. yeah. Um, Bobby, uh, yeah. You're, talking about, you're talking about having two or more teachers in the classroom. No, uh, I'm talking. I'm talking about having a teacher, and when the mentor goes in to the classroom. So in our Pacific schools, we they go in four times a term, and work alongside them. But often, but that causes them to start to think about their practices. Yeah, but I'm, um, I'm coming from uh, when there's only one teacher in the classroom. Yeah, well, I think, I think that they, I think teachers can be made to be uncomfortable or comfortable with being uncomfortable, even by um, challenging them about the problems that they're using. Like, I did quite a lot of work on Niue, and I was stunned because they were using New Zealand problems. And I thought, I said to them, but these kids have never been, you know, yeah. I've never been on these roads. I mean, you, anybody who's been to Niue will know that there are more potholes than roads and so on. <laughs> and so it was ridiculous to be giving them problems where they could not understand at all. So, you know, one of our things is children should not have to struggle with both the maths and the context. The context should be relevant to the children. And that, and that was my point when I did that. But that made that teacher really uncomfortable because she said, do you mean I have to write the problems so that the children can understand the context? I said, absolutely. But that'll be a lot of work. Yes, that's why you're paid to be a teacher. <laughs> so I, I think it's quite simple, really, but it is through professional development. Yeah, you know, like professional development pushes that. Is it finished? Uh, yes. Okay. Bobby, can I have a question? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the challenges that we face here in terms of working alongside teachers with their professional development in terms of uh, mentoring is having another adult in the room. 
I think they're so comfortable working on their own, and now there's yeah. another animal in the room. So they, it's the fear of the unknown, and yet oh. not recognizing it's actually professional development. I totally agree with you. That's the same here. It's it's about um, teachers. High schools here are the worst possible places because mm -hmm. a lot of the primary schools do actually have people walking through and parents coming in and out and so on. But in our high schools, those teachers go in with those children for whatever, an hour, and the doors are shut. And so you get that whole, mm, somebody else is in the room. And that, that's why the relationship between the teacher educator or the mentor is so, so important. You know, they have to have the same relationship as they have with the children. And we say also, too, that our people who go into classrooms are not there for the children, they're there for the teachers. So it's all about trust. But I agree, it is that whole, you know, isolation. And once I'm inside my classroom, no one can see what I'm doing, and I'm scared of having people in. But we have to break that down. So that's another thing. Get used to being uncomfortable. No? And that's why I use that as something. Now, if you... If you yeah, if you look at... Um, if you look at these, the use of the Pacifica values, shaping those interactions, you can see these are teachers talking about what, how the, the values shape their interactions. So these are comments that they told us the mentors said. So that whole one, but telling the teacher that it's their journey, that actually they're not good or bad, they're on a journey. And that, and that it's the children's journey because we have to change how children think about maths too, as well as the teachers, right? But I, I think the second one, the mentor was really good in terms of the discreetness, almost like a whisper, right? Try this, say this, right at the critical moment. Now that the teacher then had evidence that she could have a much richer conversation. No? Mm -hmm. And then... Then the last comment is another teacher, stopping them in their tracks, right? Because quite often we get, there are, there are three aspects of teaching mathematics in a classroom, and there are three components that make a really good maths lesson. So there is actually valuing the culture, valuing the social, and, and high-level maths thinking. And often you'll get teachers who are very good at the social and they spend the whole time telling the children you know, how good they are, blah, blah, blah. Or you'll get them very good at the cultural. Or you get them very good at the maths. But actually they need to, to combine all three to be very good at everything. And you wouldn't actually see all of that happening in every single maths lesson. You know, you, you would see some of it happening in, in maths lessons, but it would be unrealistic to say in a maths lesson, you've got to have cultural, social and mathematics. I think in a maths lesson, you've always got to have mathematics. But sometimes you won't have a cultural component if you're doing algebra. You might not have it. That, that, and that's fine. You should have a social component because children should feel safe. But here, th this is this whole shift my old mindset by pausing throughout the whole lesson. I want to shift. Now, I've been in a classroom where the teacher, uh, it was clear to me as the teacher was facilitating this lesson that there were certain children she'd never asked. And I said to her, I'm not sure that that child over there gets it. If you look at their face, body language, I think you might need to ask them. Oh, no, no, she said quietly to me. They have a really difficult home, so I never get them to speak. Now, straight away, that child's not going to learn, right? So afterwards, I had a conversation with her, 
and said, okay, let's problem solve this. What are we going to do? Went back into that classroom. She said to me, I've had tears. I've had children who put their heads down. But she said, now they're talking. They're all talking. Now, that's important. So here we're talking about empathy. Right? I'll let you read that. So the key theme sitting in behind that is that we're all learners and that the mentors have actually shared their own experiences and journeys and, and that they're not, they're on a journey too, that they're not the experts either, that we're all learning. We're all in this inquiry and we're all comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's really what that teacher is telling them. And then, and now we go to that challenging abilities with high expectation and tasks. We've actually stopped using the word abilities since we, I did this. And instead, we always talk about capabilities because cap everybody has capabilities. Everybody is capable of something. And therefore, we need to be looking at what are they capable of rather than what... You know, how able are they? So it just gets away from that whole concept. And so, see, this is a teacher who's talking about that higher order of thinking, being exposed to the fact that they, that at a young age, that they can go to a higher level of thinking and, and so on. And another teacher talking about the roadblocks, the challenges and celebrating. Right. So it is that unless teachers, and, and that's one of the things that we find when we're working with teachers, that I'll go into a classroom, like not so long ago, I went into a room where, in fact, I was working, it was in Christchurch, and they said to me, we'd like to see a lesson. And we don't normally model lessons, but because I was only going to be there for a couple of days, I said, okay, I'll take a lesson. And they said, oh, we're going to give you a year three, four. So I said, okay, I'm going to do fractions. When I took that fraction problem in the next day, the teacher immediately said, oh, nobody will be able to do that. I said, but that's the curriculum level they should be at. So, and, and also to the other thing was, I didn't know these kids. I didn't know what their capabilities were. I just put them into groups and I started teaching them. As soon as I started teaching them, different children lit up, right? They, they were coming out with all sorts of things. The teacher stood beside me and said, wow, I never knew they were capable of any of that. Right? That's just proof of, but that exposed that group of teachers to the fact that they were not um, actually reaching or allowing children opportunities at a higher level to even develop that knowledge. And the children rose to it. But of course, the good thing is that I had nothing in my head about them. I didn't have deficit thinking. I didn't know them, right? So yeah, I just went with, yep, yeah, they will do it because they're working in groups and we will build on, we will listen carefully to what comes out and we will build to the highest level of thinking that finally comes out as they as they come and explain. And that's really important. I'm just watching the time. What time do we finish? Sorry, I can't. What time? 10 minutes. Did you just say 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool.
So the, the other aspect of what we do that's tied up to the interactions is these things called mathematical practices. And the mathematical practices are different from mathematical knowledge. They are, and I've talked about them before, I've talked about the way that children need to be able to give a mathematical explanation. They need to be able to justify. They need to be able to represent so they can make sense of something themselves and so that they can make sense for other people. They need to be able to generalise to the big ideas that really matter. Now, those mathematical practices really disappeared from our curriculum document here in the 2007. And the first time that children meet these mathematical practices is often when they do NCEA. Now, they need to, to meet that five-year-olds can give a mathematical explanation. They also need to know what questions they need to ask so that they can ask them in their heads and be metacognitive to make somebody um, explain deeper, to justify, to generalise, to prove. They need to be able to use that language, not the teacher, the children need to know that. And so, but our teachers here in New Zealand have come through a schooling system where those mathematical practices were not used in classrooms. So we've had to work with teachers to get them to recognise them and affirm them when they hear them in the classroom. Like when a child says, what did you do in that bit there that caused that to happen? We expect our teachers to say, that was a great question because it made them explain so that we could all understand what they were doing. We were all a bit lost in that bit. So that was a great question. Right? So that's so here, this is this is somebody talking about how the effect of that, that they've had to reflect. Putting a question back to me. Do you think? Did you notice? Right? It's around the ways students are participating and contributing. We do this very gently. We teach them how to do mathematical explanations first, and then we shift to how to justify. We can't do it all at once. It's a journey. It's, it's, it's probably a three-year journey to get classrooms where the interactions end up with generalisations. Right? But this whole thing about getting the students to ask and answer challenging questions. For our Pacifica students to ask a challenging question or to answer a challenging question can be very intimidating. And I know that quite often I'll say to somebody in the classroom, I see you've got a question. Do you, do you need to ask it? And they'll say, uh, maybe. When I talk to them quietly, they'll say, I didn't ask that question because I didn't know whether they would know the answer. So what they're doing there is protecting the mana of the explainers. Right? Likewise, for a long time, like I spent a year going in regularly into a year seven, eight classroom. And I think it took about three terms for the children in that year seven and eight classroom to be resilient enough to, to answer questions and especially challenges. No, they had to, and we, we gave them time to practice. You know, they actually had to be taught how to do that. No, so what are you going to say? You know, what's another way of explaining that? How are you going to justify that? Stop and think about the questions other children are going to ask you. Practice how you're going to answer. When you do something like that, always... The children are really clever at identifying the, the sticky bits that other children aren't going to know the answer to. They're really clever at doing that. So they'll pick up, they'll look at how their solution has, they've developed their solution, and they'll go through it, and usually in the group will be somebody who got stuck on something. So when you stop them and you say, right, 
think about the questions other people are going to ask you, they'll pick out those sticky bits. And it, it allows that child that was stuck on that in the group another chance to rehear, rethink. And then when it comes to the larger sharing, they can easily answer all of them because they've practiced it. So it's that again, it's getting them to answer challenging questions. It's our values again, it's our respect. You know, is it respectful to challenge somebody? Well, it has to be in maths classrooms, but you're not challenging somebody, you're challenging reasoning. And this is a big one here, is actually making problems culturally responsive, as I've been talking about. But teachers come to this again, and I've seen teachers make epic failures in doing this, but the children appreciated it because they were trying. Like, for instance, it was a teacher doing a problem about um, increasing a, a recipe for making curry. And he had that they were going to take so many more teaspoons of curry out of a packet of curry. Mm. And he asked one, one of the Indian children in his classroom, he said, is this what your family do? And the Indian child looked at him and he said, no. He said, my family use herbs and spices. We don't use curry powder from a packet. <laughs> and that was fine because what the teacher said that he learned from that was he should have checked with that child beforehand, right? He, you know, and the, but that's another example of being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think that using having children able to speak in the language that they can get the most depth of understanding in is absolutely important. And so in our classrooms, the children speak in whatever language they are going to get the deepest reasoning. And that's really, really important because when you think about it, we just want them reasoning. Now, teachers sometimes feel uncomfortable with that because they say, but I don't know what they're saying. And we always say, but you can see what they're writing, you know? So, so if your children are most comfortable yeah. speaking Rarotongan, they should be speaking in, in maths, right? And then the presentation will usually be in English because that's what everybody can access unless you're in an immersion, right? But we have other cultures, of course, and so, yeah, I've seen lots of good learning. And that's what this... this um, teacher is talking about, you know, that the use of words, the correct pronunciation of them, and allowing individual children to speak in whatever language they can access. Okay, so actually, that's the end. Oh, hang on, that's uh, that. This is just a, you know, teacher beliefs about the role of mentors. But what, what should it be? And that was just us trying to see what they thought. And, and here we are talking about the mentors too on this learning journey. So here we're talking about capabilities again. So it's just a summary. So the inquiry and action is a critical aspect of both the teacher and mentor role, that we have to be in the stance of inquiry. And that 
questioning around the practice is a way of opening up new areas of reflection. But the critical analysis is reliant on the mentor-mentee relationship, that actually relationships are everything. And that inquiry stance supports everybody to envisage and theorise their practice. And that's where I'm going to stop. So questions, and then somebody can tell me time's up. Question. Yeah. Uh, no, we're talking about this budget doesn't have any, uh, you know, people's time after making us pay or talk or they usually, you know, alone. Uh, sorry, sorry, you're coming in and out. Can... Wait, 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 Mama. You were mentioning about uh, our, our children, eh? the Tamariki or the Pacifica. In classrooms, say, uh, teachers find them um, uh, put down or they look down or they don't uh, participate as well as the others. Yeah. Um, does that uh, make it? With um, within the education or the math classes, or in the level below, does that um, contribute to that type of? Absolutely, absolutely. Or... Yeah, because because the teachers don't come from the same demographics, don't understand the children, and don't realise the effects of the dominant culture as being taken as that's the only culture that causes our children not to achieve in school and to go off education. Yeah. So it is the long arm of colonisation that has caused that. And we've got to change it because we can't afford to have a whole group of children absolutely disadvantaged, not through any reason of their own, but because of an education system. Any other questions? Kirana Bobby. Uh, my, my, my interest is because we are doing this in the, the Cook and Maori, the real Cook Island. Oh, cool. You were using your math uh, backgrounds for, for your, to, to share your ideas of mentors and mentees. But my, 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 my question is based around you were talking about the ability grouping in the, the language yeah. Uh, yeah. in the Kuka and Māori. Yeah. So to me, uh, because we haven't tested it, that, no, that's the problem. We haven't put into to, to real research to find if it's working or not. So what, what, what do you think about, or what would, what would be the, the advantages or the disadvantages of of this using in the in the language, the Reo Māori. Using you, your... Yeah, if you're using Te Reo Māori, and that's the language that the children speak in at home and are absolutely comfortable in, then that's the language they should be using in maths. But if they are, like Niue was interesting, Niue, they had, up until the children were eight, they had the children all learning in Vangaha, and then they switched to English. A lot of the children came in at five speaking only English. So actually, in reality, in the maths classroom, they needed to be speaking in English because that was the language they could access the maths. Mm. You see, can you see what I'm talking about? And so I think, I think whatever language you can access the maths is the language you should be speaking. So if your children are competent real speakers, then that's what they should be speaking. But if they're okay. not, whatever language they speak, like if you've got Fijian children speaking Fijian and you've only got two of them, 
they still should be speaking Fijian until they have enough of the other language. Okay, I think Retire's question might have been slightly different to that in terms of can we use the strategies that you've developed for mathematics in another curriculum area outside of math? Oh. So, like, if we were to do it, to take your strategies that you use in mathematics and do it in the real Kupiarangi classes for second language learners of Māori, do you think it would transfer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it would be no different. You know, it's, it's a way of thinking about learning, how children learn. It's a way of drawing on who they are in terms of their identity. So take, you know, in any part of the curriculum, there should be no competition, no speed, no individualism. They should, we should be bringing the values that they have at home into the school. And we should be making it contextually relevant. And so if they're in that immersion class, that's how they should be learning. But I, I'll, I'll say something about that. Like people will say, but when, when will they ever be able to do something that isn't in their context? Well, if they learn first in their own cultural context, then it transfers easily into another context. Like we have examples of our very young children here learning um, algebra and patterning. And they were seven-year-old children using um, the sasa, the beat of the sasa and so on. Now, these children, when they were tested on non-contextualised, couldn't generate the pattern, like buttons, 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 you know, whatever. Couldn't do that. However, once they, it was put into a cultural context, they could generate the pattern. Afterwards, after we did that work with them, when we went to non-contextual, they could do it. So there's got to be a transfer so that they become strong. But what I said earlier, children should never have to struggle with the context and the actual intellectual thinking. So I think everything should be appropriate, culturally um, responsive. I don't know if that answers what you're asking. One of the things too, Bobby, that, um, <clears throat> sorry, it's James here. Uh, yeah. Just listening to what Retire was saying, um, I think it's automatically happening at the moment where teachers from the outer islands are obviously teaching in their real from their island. Uh, yeah. But in Rarotonga here, it's James. mainly in English. Yeah. The issue there becomes that I think what the teachers here in terms of Cook Island Māori are working in is a system where um, they're not calling it ability levels now, but obviously you would think cool. that in terms of the real, the outer island students will be a much better position. Okay. Yeah. yeah. More capable. Yeah. Um, but still they're all reported at the same sort of level. Oh, I think yeah. I came across this term yesterday uh, with discussion with the principal that uh, when I asked about the statistics that rolled out for the year four and year eight testing for Māori literacy, um, and I questioned some of those results that came out because what it was actually saying was that some of the Rarotongan cohort of students at years four and eight were actually in fact doing better than the outer island students Māori. statistically. So yeah. that's an example of the system in which the Māori language teachers are working under um, having to try and adapt. And I think they talked about it being there's an expectation of second language acquisition for Rarotongan schools and first language acquisition for outer island schools. So, but it's being reported in the same sort of uh, area, yeah. the, the, yeah. the same sort of data. Yeah, yeah, I think it, there you go again with like achievement data. And making comparisons and like I, I always think you know that it's almost like assimilation that you've got to yeah. be the same everybody's got to be the same yeah and that's yeah. I think we have a big problem with that I guess what I'm saying is I'm taking on what you're saying about uh, contextualized and culturally appropriate 
uh, teaching strategies for those students that are in the outer islands and the students that are here. Yeah, yeah. Basically differentiating the data sets that come in. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing, they just seem skewed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, Bobby, I think we're going to have to end there because yep, we have, sure. a, uh, have a break and also before we start the next, uh, they yep. just go to another uh, session with Aki Nicholas, or Aki Nicholas at 12, right? <laughs> um, but who was going to thank today? Who was thanking today? Oh, oh, is is your, uh, oh is it me? No, retire. Okay. Bobby, if you're on. Thank you very much for your sharing your research. It did help us in the way of us teachers uh, in your mathematical uh, area. And uh, thank you very much for, for that. And I'm pretty sure it will help us in our uh, research into our Fukan Maori and uh, the, the problems, the questions, the issues that we are facing with the RL. So hopefully that your presentation this morning will help us indeed. Thank you very much. God bless you, uh, Bobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, I hope it does. So I hope that I've given you some gems that you'll be able to build on. And, and I hope to be over there and see you all sometime soon. Open up the button. To us yeah, open yeah. the board up. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, uh, Except we've got to keep you safe. So. I know you're using some Bobby Maths, yes. So there's some trial schools in Rarotonga using yep. Bobby Maths. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Avarua. Yeah, yeah, lots. Yeah, so. Okay. We'll see you. Happy day. Thank you so much, Bobby. Yeah. Bye. Bye.